Hello and Namaste. This is another episode of the Almost Daily Zendak. All right, let's get started, folks. Hello and namaste. Thank you for tuning in and listening. I want to send a special bit of thanks uh, to all those out there that uh, downloaded a bunch of episodes last couple of months, or a couple of weeks rather, because I hit a new, uh, a new fun number. I gotta, I, one moment, let me look it up. Uh, I just want to take a moment to say thanks and celebrate the fact that we've had 295 downloads and 331 plays. Um, Having start, you know, on Sprecher.com, having started at a place where those numbers were all zeros for many weeks, uh, it's nice to realize that someone's listening. <laughs> and thank you, whoever you are. Uh, okay, so today's episode uh, Forgiveness. We might be doing it wrong. Uh, a deep questioning of our society's default assumptions about forgiveness and how it works with some postmodern mystic suggestions about how to reboot forgiveness as a personal, social, and global phenomenon. Um, And this is our first episode of our new season. For those scratching their heads going, wait, what? New season? I don't understand. Uh, I'm following the theater schedule of theater seasons because that's my day job. And so this would be sort of the time where in our calendars we stop working on last season and we start preparing for the new season so this is new season season two uh right so uh as part of the new season i'm going to endeavor to keep the episodes shorter that might be something i fail at you'll have to forgive me folks (laughs) okay so forgiveness how is it commonly thought of that's the first thing I, I focused on when addressing, you know, addressing the theme for this, uh, for today's episodes. And uh, how is it commonly thought of is kind of a challenging question. I think that with any big emotional idea, there's as many definitions for it as there are people, right? Because we all have a, our own unique relationship to that idea or some set of ideas. But I think we can also zoom back and look at things at a you know society-wide uh, perspective uh, and make some generalizations. So I do paint with a broad brush when I say the following. I think it is entirely common to think of uh, the activity of forgiveness in an almost commercial fashion. In other words, transactionally. I will forgive you because you will invoke this because of your actions or because you've proved worthy of. There's some transaction there. Uh, And it feels like, I think, based on my observations over several years of of observing the world and specifically the arguments presented by those in different camps, different uh, spiritualities or different religions or different ideological frameworks within one common religion, as in, like, the various flavors of Christianity here in the United States, um, that this is a statistical norm that's been increasing over the last 40 years. Uh, That forgiveness is increasingly 
passed on to new minds as a transactional event, that there's a cost, that there's a price attached to it. Is that right? And who am I to question it? Well, as a provocateur, I'm just here to provoke to the question, is that right? Is that how something like forgiveness should be modeled and executed behaviorally? I think that's a really big question because we live in a world where there's a lack, a very palpable, visceral, unignorable lack of forgiveness going on. At the root of all our conflicts, at the root of all our theaters of war, at the root of everywhere you see groups of people punching each other or more, you know, higher levels of violence, there's unequivocally, and I know that at first, it's not the first thing we think of. The first thing we think of about any conflict is, well, what are the causes? What are the domino effect things that led up to it? And we never, we are not encouraged by the news, by our thought leaders, by our cultural leaders, by our spiritual leaders to ask the question, where's the forgiveness in this conflict? Or in, and, and no conflict is black or white. No conflict uh, is uh, that, you know, one dimensional, of course. But let's, let's ask the unasked question. You can zoom into any conflict you want. The bullshit in Syria the bullshit in, in between Israel and Palestine, anywhere you want in the world. Go there and look at the reporting, look at the public statements by those on the ground who lead the people who are executing the violence. Is anybody asking, hey, where's the forgiveness, yo? Nope. I don't see it. I don't see it on Fox News. Don't see it on CNN. Don't see it on uh, social media. I don't see it in the conversations people have over the water cooler about those conflicts, don't see it. I, I don't mean, to, I don't see all, right? But I mean, if we're going to look at things statistically, odds are it's the least asked question about the situation. Why? I propose to you the, the, you know, the following thesis. Maybe we have been encouraged for generations now, arguably for centuries now, to conceive of the function of forgiveness incorrectly in other words not as as it actually occurs in nature but as it might rationally seem to make sense to be you know how it functions this transactionalism of forgiveness the way it seems to be in effect and what is that rendered a lack of forgiveness many of us in the like anti-war pro love camp are quite familiar with that now very famous meme of uh, a Palestinian father and an Israeli father hugging and forgiving each other because their children are now all dead due to the conflict there. And those two individuals said, enough, I don't want this anymore. And their children, I think, were directly responsible for each other's children's death. That might be mythos, as that meme has floated around for quite some time, as that you know, that conflict in that particular geographic place has existed since long before the internet. Um, but anyway, there that example of, you know, forgiveness transcends the conflict. Uh, those of us are, who are already on this camp of how do we end war, we're, we're really familiar with it, but I think that for uh, the average schmo out there in the world, the cultural conditioning runs the other way. It's that you, that no one, there's a lot of, strange norms that float around the concept of forgiveness. Uh, one of which I encourage people to challenge and question and think through is that only God above has the right to forgive. Now, for those who are convinced that God exists but only exists externally as an objectified, personified person in some place over there, this makes lots of logical sense. But here's the thing, my friends. Logic does not accurately describe reality. It often fails at that. Logic accurately describes plausible flows of thought in sentences. 
So logic can be very airtight sounding at times because all the sentences connect and all the words in the sentences are true and all those sentences create a paragraph that our sentence-oriented ego mind goes, mm hmm, don't see any flaws there. And yes, there may be zero flaws in the logic of something, the logic of why Israel and Palestine must fight each other can be flawless from either perspective of Israel or Palestine, right? But there's an ignoring of reality at a level that is never recognized in any logic. Logic inherently ignores things about reality and then does not acknowledge that it is ignoring those things. Thus, I propose to you that the logic behind a transactional forgiveness is inherently, while logical and seeming like, yeah, it could be very well the way it works. I don't see any flaws to why, you know, I don't see any words inside the logical explanation that would indicate that it wouldn't work this way. There's organic, natural reality being ignored and unaccounted for in said transactional logic. Which begs the question, okay, if that is so, how does forgiveness actually work? Let's, let's bore down on this. Um, and immediately the question might be, well, if you have an answer, where are your, what are your sources? <laughs> I just sort of invalidated logic in this realm. And I didn't mean to. I, I, I believe that logic helps us to wrap our sentence-oriented part of our brain around big, complicated things. But it also has lots of flaws. Um, for example, logic ignores the mysterious. It just refuses to acknowledge that it is so. But any honest, genuine look at the rawness of nature will humble a person and go, yeah, there's some mysterious things about it that I cannot wrap my brain around and that logic cannot explain. Um, that the rules of logic can't embrace, but yet are still true. Forgiveness, I propose to you, is one of those things. This transactional definition of logic ignores energy. For those of you who are longtime listeners, you'll recognize the path I'm le I might be indicating. Uh, as always, my, for any new listeners... I am not here to define what I think you should believe. I'm here to share with you things I think are true and encourage you to question that which you believe. Go figure it out. It's your job. I'm not here to, to, to impose upon you a belief system. Uh, in fact, my ultimate goal is to encourage the self-liberation from all belief systems because uh, belief systems impede your understanding of reality as it actually functions. Uh, and that's something you should question for yourself. So, based on some research and some pragmatic experience and some uh, uh, identifying of uh, wisdom that exists in all cultures that is buried in the bullshit that is inherent in all cultural settings, um, I find that the following is consistent um, and accurate in terms of what ancient cultures and different reli all religions have at one point taught, despite the fact that the postmodern trend is to not really comply with it as a teaching. And that's that forgiveness must be unconditional for it to function. If you are not unconditionally for forgiving someone, then you are not actually forgiving them in the terms of what forgiveness is as to how it works in the universe. Um, so forgiveness operates unconditionally and in concurrence with and conforming to the organic fractal realities of sacred geometry. Now that's a big mouthful of a sentence, which is going to make it really difficult to keep this episode 15 minutes long because I am now at 14 minutes and 46 seconds. But um, let's just focus, hone in for now for the remainder of this episode. I'm going to have to break it up into a deeper episode. Um, the unconditional part. Where, why? 
Why and wherefore? There are some things that require unconditionality in order to properly function because they are not ideas, they are energies actual energies of legitimate frequency that someday we'll be able to measure with technical devices that as of yet we have not figured out how to create those devices. Um, And this is something that if you dig deep at the core and roots of all the major religions, uh, this is so. According not to me, but to the prophet who spoke for that religion and some of the commentators who interpreted those prophets' words. Um, And or God itself has has been known to describe this um, in different contexts. All things are energy. The brilliant scientist uh, uh, Einstein, regardless of whatever political and personal flaws the haters can bring up, put it really eloquently. E equals mc squared. That is a measurable, verifiable, tangible f- thing about the universe that can be described best as law and that it exists in an unbreakable fashion. In other words, that if you break it, it and nothing works. Um, and that, that literally means everything is energy and energy is everything. It's just operating at different frequencies. So if forgiveness is a tangible, measurable energy in the universe akin to, and in fact deeply related to, love, which we all know is also taught to be manifested unconditionally by everybody from Jesus to Buddha to Muhammad. Never mind that everybody's killing each other over which one of those guys had it right today. We got Buddhists killing people we got everybody killing everybody right um but buddha jesus muhammad and everybody on the list that qualifies under the same parameters as those three individuals as prophets all spoke of love being an unconditional um activity that one does not love someone based on conditions one loves someone uh according to its uh, one's own manifesting that divine energy. So our society does not allow for categorizing certain ideas or concepts um, this way. We are not encouraged or allowed to openly engage in exploring using the energetic frequencies of love nor that that of forgiveness. We are instead cajoled, tricked, fooled, and brainwashed. Sorry, I don't mean to offend. We've all been brainwashed. I've said it before, say it again. I myself am no, not claiming to be better or more special than anybody else. We are a society. We blame society. We are a society. Society brainwashes us because we have allowed the brainwashing to occur. In a way, it's almost required because we can't pass a test if we aren't put under testful conditions, right? Um, If we were already always unconditionally loving and forgiving, there would be no test. We have to have an absence of unconditional love and unconditional forgiveness in order to feel the palpable absence and consequences of that, which is a lack of healing, a lack of great health or thrivingness both at an individual level, at an intrapersonal level, at a species-wide level. So, unconditionality, as opposed to transactionality. Um, They are, we can line them up as opposites. If you are behaving in a transactional fashion, then you are preventing yourself from behaving in an unconditional fashion, regardless of whether you're talking about honesty, love, forgiveness, um, collaboration, you know, insert any word of activity, energetic or otherwise, (laughs) and and you can see that this dynamic uh, is consistent. If we're doing 
it transactionally than we are blocking ourselves from doing it, preventing ourselves, making ourselves incapable of doing it unconditionally. This is true at all scales, whether you're talking about a childhood friendship, um, the love partner of your life that you're going to marry, um, you know, any relationship between two people. This is also true in our relationship with ourselves. And this is key. This is key and important, friends. Uh, this is where I... I guess I'm going to just blow past this 15-minute shorter segments episode. No, I, I'm at right at halfway point. 24 minutes and 9 seconds um, left in the... Otherwise, I think it's 45 minutes. Sidebar. Digressing. We've come full circle to the... Uh, how it is in concurrence and conformity to uh, organic fractal boundaries of sacred geometry. Uh, everything has its opposite. Dig back to a previous episode about the virtuous cycle and vicious cycle. If you haven't heard it yet, I'll catch you up real quick, but it's worth uh, digging in and going and listening to that. Um, anything and everything can either be an ego trap or uh, a, self, a tool of self-liberation. The ego trap is a tool of self-oppression, self-mental slavery to the beliefs or constructs or ideologies that we adhere to, that we subscribe to, that we enslave ourselves to. Um, and obviously the opposite, its opposite, is the liberation thereof. I like to remind people that we're not only asked to liberate ourselves from ideas, but we're literally asked to liberate ourselves from our very minds. To return, you know, to purify the mind, to clean back, that's what they mean. That's what the ancients are talking about when they're talking about purifying the self. Uh, sacred geometry. If you don't know what that is, I'm not going to turn this episode into a big explanation about sacred geometry. And plenty of people do a wonderful job of explaining the fundamentals. Um, one of the things that's important to grasp here is that it is consistent throughout nature. People can disagree about whether or not they choose to believe in sacred geometric form, but it is consistent, measurable, verifiable, and repeatable right out there in the very cosmos as it exists. Therefore, if you're choosing to ignore it, you are choosing to deny yourself the truth of nature. Uh, one of the things that I'm, I'm going to zoom in on is that, as Pythagoras pointed out, there are indeed primary forms. And they are echoed throughout the entire fractal uh, thing we call the universe. Uh, these primary forms are not just abstractions of mathematics because mathematics is just a tool, right? What the mathematics is describing is that which we are measuring in reality or conceptualizing in our mind. Um, and if we conceptualize it in our mind and it doesn't exist, we can build it and it would still adhere to the mathematical rules that we used to conceive of it, correct? It works the other way around my friends, we observe nature more deeply and more deeply and more deeply and we see that at all scales it does indeed adhere to uh, it will enlighten us to undiscovered aspects of sacred geometry and other mathematical fields because the universe itself is functioning in those forms which we use the numbers to describe Okay, one of those forms that's very important very, very important and it's not an accident that it is symbolically littered throughout the world. Uh, in my research and in my uh, observation, I've noticed that there's, there's two paths about like trying to figure out stuff. You can focus on all the differences, or you can focus on the similarities in, in what you are researching. And both are valid, and I'm not arguing uh, that one is better than the other. In fact, I think that the two together become a you know very powerful tool uh, that generates. Ooh, sorry, Buddha. 
oh, there was a scary spider that just landed on me, and I very knee-jerkedly, reflexively squashed it, and I apologize. For those who know me well, I apologize to the individual insect when I squish them, and I, I pray for it because it is one of us. We are all alive, and I'm, you know, they are, luckily though, and, and for, there are people who struggle with this, and this has gotten everything to do with what we're talking about, and yet seems like absolutely nothing to do. What do we do with the problem of yucky bugs? Spiritually, it has bugged me from the very beginning of my research. There's no, I began this sort of exploration at a very young age, and this has always been a problem because I was, before I began, or in fact, one of the triggers to my interest in spiritual seeking or researching or you know, investigating these matters was that uh, I was given this gift of this natural encyclopedia, this sort of children's photo encyclopedia of natural stuff. It was beautiful, beautiful photography, high def images of wonderful, amazing, awe inspiring things in nature. And please forgive me, uh, Mother Earth and all things involved, all spiritual entities or um, things involved. The bugs freaked me the fuck out. Forgive me, I, I, it's just the truth. And um, so, yeah, I mean, this is not news, right? Lots of people are freaked out by spiders. In fact, it's one of those creepy, edgy meme trends. It's its own meme stream of meme. And that's that we love, hate, love to freak ourselves out with images of ever increasing any gross bugs that exist in the world that we have blessedly rarely exposed to. And they themselves are alive, they are life. They are life no different than us. Um, that sounds crazy to some people that, that inherently divide uh, people from all other nature. But an honest evaluation of how nature operates will render that idea um, useless in, in the long term. We will realize that we cannot divide ourselves as supreme or above nature. Um, if we could, then the human species uh, would never have um, destroyed all of its natural uh, predators. We only appear to have um, supremacy in nature because we've destroyed and, and or almost radically destroyed all of the predators that would have otherwise kept our population in check. That is the fact of reality, not some conceptualization ideal, you know, ideal ideology about how nature should be. The fact of nature is that uh, uh, arachnids overproduce babies on purpose. Why? They are the food of other creatures. We often get caught up in these divisions because we think of reality as transactional and we anchor that transactionality in our ego construct. And then we don't want to be someone else's food. So we kill them all. We assassinated everyone that could have eaten us instead of figuring out a way to you know, we sort of pretend that we figured out a way. We keep them in zoos now. The truth of the matter is, let's if we're really, really honest, zoos are not educational because those creatures are in cages. No human being, no human being in their right mind would submit to living in a human zoo, no matter how pretty and well organized it was, because that is slavery and or punishment of some form. Why do we uh, put animals in zoos? Because we're afraid of them and they can eat us. And instead of transcending that uh, through organic means, um, we, have, we are permanently punishing the survivors of our genocide. Um, and yes, I'm not a vegan. I'm a horrible, horrible, horrible Buddhist. I'm not a vegan yet. Um, but that's I've already done a whole episode about that, I think. And I'll do a whole other episode about it again in season two. Let's zoom back here. Um, we have a lot to work through, right? There's a lot of trauma there. I think that's why I went off on that tangent. Um, we have to beg them for forgiveness to, in order to heal ourselves, to move on, to, to figure out the right way to have a relationship with nature. Uh, was my point. So there are these primary things, these primary energies that exist in the universe. We have been conditioned to ignore them, to live without them. And guess what, my friends? That has caused spiritual sickness. Spiritual sickness at the individual level 
which we may or may not realize is happening. I experience it. You experience it. You may deny that you agree with this assessment at first, but an honest look into yourself and you will see it and sense it. The very fact that we've been denied the truth generationally for centuries now um, has caused spiritual malady at the individual level. At the intrapersonal level, uh, in, you know, in, in terms of all our one-on-one relationships are tainted by this. And of course, this renders a result at the global or society-wide or species-wide level. Why is this important? The, the great majority of public discourse is focused on identifying and complaining about, for lack of a better term, all the different problems that we face. But not a whole heck of a lot of functional, pragmatic prescriptions on how to solve them. And here's what's the kicker. Here's the kick to the teeth, friends. Here's the adding insult to injury. We already know the solution. It's already been identified, and it has been recommended to us by the prophets. Um, And what we have repeatedly done is ostracize them, kill them, belittle them, reduce their contribution to our evolution to marginalized, hocus-pocus, throw the baby out with the bathwater, you know, barely eking by a set of um, ideas that exist outside of the norm of society. Primary in the sacred geometry of everything are the following... They are not ideas here. They are actions. They are energies in action. And they originate from source. So source is the unity, the central unity at the beginning of sacred geometry, right? Everything began with a point, a singularity. That's why in astrophysics, the astrophysicists looking through their astrophysicist lenses and not and, and logic, because logic is useful. Logic is useful to focus our attention, right? I didn't mean to completely ridicule and, and oust logic in, in its entirety. I'm just pointing out that, you know, the flaw of it. Now, In astrophysics, through the lens of astrophysics logic, we see the universe expanding from what? A singularity. Why is that so at the cosmic level? Because at every level of the self-referencing fractal, it all originates, as in present tense, currently happening, and originated, as in past tense, that which happened before, from one singularity, and that is source. That is the thing that we sometimes, and very foolishly, personify into the character we call God. Um, At the very nexus of what singularity is doing, it is the projection of the following cosmic energies. Love, forgiveness, compassion, acceptance, and healing. This can be uh, personally experienced. And I propose to you, in theory, this can be intrapersonally experienced. I have experienced it, but, um, the, but I've also sort of been lacking for many volunteers to continue uh, to verify that phenomenon with others. It's a very intimidating thing. Why? Because we've been lied to about forgiveness. The very root of that lie lies the obstacle of self-forgiveness. We have a bitch of a time forgiving ourselves. Therefore, and in conjunction with the fact that we have a very hard time loving ourselves, we therefore have little compassion for ourselves spiritually, intellectually, emotionally. We have low rate of self-acceptance, right? I'm speaking in broad terms. These are the themes of our dramas in life. Our our low level of self-forgiveness, low level or lack of self-love, lack of self-compassion, lack of self-acceptance. This is commonly uh, displayed as body dysmorphia and self-loathing depression and 
self-mutilating harm, right? Therefore, we lack the ability to heal ourselves. And it's a vicious cycle because we need to heal. And clearly, Obamacare is not doing it enough. They're not doing it right. Um, and I want to bring – sorry to drag some politics in. This is something I, I'll talk in depth over at uh, uh, Good Morning Trumptopia. But let's look at that health care situation really quick. The politicians are arguing over how to profiteer best on our sickness and their meddling with our healing. Meanwhile, Jesus – you can look this up. You can verify this for yourself – he didn't charge one dime. He healed people for free. With what? Divine energy. Energy from source. In Christian terms, God's grace. Now, there's a lot of muck. There's a lot of, as many of you are in agreement here, but there's a lot of our brothers and sisters out in the world clinging to the muck and therefore not seeing the shimmering gems of true wisdom that remain buried under all that muck in every faith. They are thinking of all these things transactionally anchored in our ego root and therefore lacking all these primary, lacking access and lacking awareness of and lacking the ability to work with these primary energies of the universe. We distract ourselves of the million distractions and we never exorcise our spiritual muscles in love. Now, I know that that's not 100% always true, right? There's plenty of people out there in, of all the kinds, of all the flavors, of all the shapes and sizes, of all the religious affiliations that do indeed try to flex these muscles. But the, but the overwhelming majority are not doing it in a way that is concurrent with how it actually works in the universe. Because zero ideologies describe the universe 100% accurately. I've talked about that plenty. Um, these primary triangles I just described, uh, in, uh, well, actually, I kind of failed to describe them very carefully. In sacred geometry, one of the primary shapes is the pyramid which is comprised of three triangles, which means the triangle is even more primary than the pyramid. Let me present to you my understanding of three facets of some of the most primal sacred geometry, stuff that you don't see on YouTube, stuff that very few people are actually talking about. Why? Because if we could heal ourselves and each other for free, they couldn't profiteer on us anymore. And if we could heal our, ourselves and each other for free... Those of us with those powers would no longer volunteer for endless war. You see the pattern, right? All right. So there's the inner personal triangle of these uh, three interconnected cosmic phenomena. Unconditional love internally for thy love thyself, as, uh, as it is put somewhere. Simultaneously, that connects with the singular forgiveness of self, which we've been told we don't have the authority to do, um, which is, of course, that's a lie, and that lie is exposed by many, uh, such as my favorite example is Rumi, who teaches um, some profound truth with great passion and clarity. He says, ah, you are seeking God. How funny. That within you that is doing the looking is what you seek. That's a really horrible paraphrasing of it. I don't think that's how it's phrased. Forgive me, that's me. But anyways, um, so when a, a human individual has a healthy manifestation of unconditional love of oneself, which you cannot do without radically accepting oneself exactly as you are and forgiving oneself uh, at that level, then one can manifest healing of self, um, right? Right? When people achieve this, this is what allows a person to achieve that intrapersonally with others. The, earlier I asked, where is the healing? Everyone's in pain. All souls are suffering. That hashtag should, should be trending soon. Um, 
But when you look at a dynamic conflict that has no logical conclusion, there is no logic that will end the problem between Israel and Palestine. But those who can master their relationship with this inter- inner personal dynamic then can transcend the self and manifest love, forgiveness, compassion, acceptance, and healing unto and with another. And once uh, we can love each other, forgive each other, act with compassion with and, and uh, in accordance to each other, radically accept each other and heal each other uh, at an individual intrapersonal way because each individual involved in the intrapersonal transaction has achieved an inner personal mastery of this, which is not easy, even when we aren't buried in centuries of brainwashing, then we can achieve a network-wide or species-wide manifestation of unconditional love for the species, for all the individuals in the species, a radical acceptance of the totality of humanity, which will heal the totality of humanity, even if some of our individuals are still raging assholes like Donald Trump and his whole cabal of political, uh, uh, you know, crazy sociopaths. Um, Why is this true? Not because I say so. Not because the man known as Jesus said so, which he did in his own way, in his own context, in his own historical period. Not because Buddha said there is no one person that said so, that had the ultimate authority for saying so. Why? Because all personhoods are merely uh, illusions for the unity of source. You cannot be separate from the universe, right? And it all flows out of this um, original singularity, does it not? Now, there's a lot of argument, there's a lot of theories that oppose those statements and present a lot of logical um, constructs uh, that describe the universe otherwise. Um, but always in, at the center of uh, my sharing here with you on this podcast, my point and my proof or the links, you know, everyone goes, links or it didn't happen, you know, pictures or it didn't happen. The evidence I propose to you is the evidence that you, yes, you, my dear listener, as an individual, you can go directly into yourself and experience. What better proof can you ask for than that which you cannot deny is resident in your own being? So... It's really hard because we've, you know, like I keep bringing back to, we've been lied to for so long. A lie repeated often enough will supplant the truth in an individual's mind. But that does not mean that the truth ceases to exist. Um, If you want to know the truth, don't ask other people. Don't trust what I have to say. But take up my humble invitation to go find it out for yourself deep within. Find a method of meditation that works for you, whatever that meditation might be, swimming, jogging, anything, according to uh, the wisest of the wise folks out there from every century, anything can be uh, utilized. Any activity of the body and mind can be utilized as meditation. Um, So I digress. Uh, A clear observation of reality will render the conclusion that, yeah, one cannot debunk love. One can deny it in oneself, etc. I am out of time, friends. Thank you for listening. Forgive me for not going only 15 minutes as I intended to. There was just a lot to say. Um, And I, you know, felt inspired to say it by something beyond myself. And I'm out of time. If you appreciate what I'm sharing, uh, please share it with others. If you uh, want to help support this series of podcasts, reach a broader uh, scope of audience, you can uh, visit my Patreon page at patreon.com and subscribe for as little as a dollar a month. Uh, Not because I want your money, but because uh, uh, more people out there are looking for confirmation that they are not crazy 
And that's what this show's about. May peace, love, and grooviness be with you. Thanks for listening.